Manning Center Conference is on in Ottawa this weekend, and everybody who's anybody is there. Not me, of course, but that's beside the point. I'm joined now by Matt Buffton. He's the Executive Director of the Institute for Liberal Studies, a uh, speaker at the conference. And let's start with the big picture. Why is this conference a good thing? I mean, I think this is a great thing because it brings people together to talk about ideas. In a sense, a lot of uh, political conventions have a bit of a pretense, maybe, of talking about ideas. Uh, but most of it, in the end of the day, comes down to how to get elected and what can we do, how can we run better campaigns. I think the Manning Center uh, conference brings something really different because it's people talking about what ideas, what things we should be pursuing, and what's important. And at the same time, though, there is this attention to detail. I think partly when Preston Manning arrived in Ottawa with a bunch of rookie MPs, he would quickly discovered that... If you don't have the nuts and bolts skills, it's going to be very hard to advance the ideas and values you think are important. Yeah, no, I think that's certainly a, a part of it. And uh, certainly there are some people who are more from a partisan side. Uh, yeah, we're a nonpartisan organization. For us, what's really interesting is any opportunity to bring people together to talk about the ideas of freedom, and especially young people. And with uh, Congressman Ron Paul out, our former Congressman Paul out uh, this morning, there was a really big youth contingent, and that was really great to see. Yeah, and the, the Broadband Institute ridiculed the notion that you might actually want to talk about controversial ideas in a fearless way. I mean, heaven forfend that such a thing should happen. But he's got to be especially interesting to people like yourselves because you're more on the libertarian uh, part of this big tent. Absolutely. I was actually quite disappointed in the approach the Broadband Institute took because uh, Ron Paul has been a uh, leading voice in the anti-war movement and the anti-drug war movement for, uh, for at least the past eight years, maybe a bit longer than that even. Uh, so I think if they looked a bit more closely at his positions, they'd see there's some stuff they would like, even if they don't agree with him on everything. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, and Manning has talked about this, this big tent, and we all know the conservatism has its, uh, its libertarian wing, or the free market wing. It's got its hawkish wing and then it's got its social conservative wing and you know it's a stool with three legs it's not always obvious they're connected to the same seat but libertarians are the ones who i think on most issues would have more sympathy with the left uh i, I witnessed this thing in the united states where ron paul's son was filibustering over the question of the use of drones to kill americans and he finally got a Democratic senator to stand up and say, yeah, that bugs me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's always a big question in the libertarian movement. You know, should we work with conservatives? Should we work with modern liberals? Uh, of course, we consider ourselves to be the true and classical liberals. And, uh, and the question goes back and forth. And one of the things we've really been disappointed in is the complete lack of uh, the left holding Obama to account on the foreign wars, on the drones. And I think what uh, Senator Rand Paul did uh, last night was absolutely amazing. And certainly I encourage that sort of thing uh, from uh, conservatives and libertarians. Yeah, it's interesting too because I was at one point I was uh, sent to cover an NDP convention, and so I read up on the history of socialism, which uh, I might as well have been re reading up on Max Planck for all the good it did me in terms of uh, they, there didn't seem an interest in the NDP in the history of socialism. There doesn't seem to be much interest in the Liberal Party in the history of liberalism. You say I'm a classical liberal, they won't even bother to disagree with you. Uh, and, and, but in in the conservative world, at least there's some interest in the basis of conservatism and its its past and its future in philosophical terms. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think uh, whenever I meet a, a conservative who's more of a big C conservative or, or a small C conservative who's not too familiar with libertarian ideas, they're often quite interested in the stuff that we do, what we think about certain things. And uh, one of the things I, I think is really important in the conservative movement that I wish I saw more of in the modern left or the social democratic movement is an awareness that uh, results matter, not just intentions. So you can make great mm -hmm. policies that are intended to help the poor, but if they don't help the poor, they're not really that good. Yeah, now there I would say you just put yourself squarely in the conservative camp. It, it, Thomas Sowell talks about this, one of the absolutely central dividing points between uh, what he calls constrained and unconstrained, but it's really right and left, is the importance of intentions. You know, Robert Kennedy's line, don't tell me the rules, tell me the problem. This theory that if you have good intentions, nothing can really stand in your way. Or Justin Trudeau saying, well, people know that my heart is in the right place, as though this somehow were enough to overcome the practical difficulties versus libertarians who will often, if you let them, start explaining to you that this good idea is going to run afoul of the following set of unintended consequences and therefore is actually a bad idea. Absolutely. I think one of the most interesting developments in the libertarian movement in the past couple of years has been a blog called Bleeding Heart Libertarians. That's a group of academics, mostly philosophers, who align themselves with the social democrats in terms of the ends, but are firmly in the libertarian camp in terms of means. So rather than a more conservative individual responsibility, pull yourself up by a bootstraps approach, they say, we really care about the poor, and the way to help them is not to have too much government involvement in their lives. In, in which sense you're almost, and forgive me, because this has become a term of abuse, I have no idea how, but in some ways that makes you neoconservatives. It was classically defined as a liberal who's been mugged by reality, <laughs> as somebody who has not lost their heart, but who has found their head. 
Neoconservative is a term that I don't like to use. I've actually determined anytime anyone calls you a neo anything, it's almost entirely meant as a pejorative. Uh, so it's not a, not a term that I, I use to describe myself, but I could certainly see where you're coming from there. And when you think about Ron Paul, too, I mean, I had sympathy with a lot of things he said, and I was appalled by, particularly in foreign policy, I thought he was not responsible. But he's a, a staunch libertarian who's also pro-life. I mean, he, he delivered babies. And a lot of libertarians, it seems to me that's one of the places libertarians are actually divided, is on this question of, of uh, pro-choice versus pro-life. Absolutely. And I, I really think that uh, the, uh, the pro-life, pro-choice question is one of those things, there is no correct libertarian position. You know, if you believe that life begins at conception and the role of government is to protect uh, life, then you should be a pro-life libertarian. If you have a different view and you're worried about government intrusion and laws and you don't believe that life forms, uh, begins at conception, then maybe you should be a pro-choice libertarian. But there is no correct libertarian position on that issue. And, and this, again, I'm going to turn this back a bit at the Broadband Institute and at the NDP, that you get a conservative movement that has divisions on this question. And within the conservative movement, parts of the conservative movement have divisions. And yet, if you want to be a liberal or NDP, or, there's an orthodoxy here, which is not meant to be subjected to searching analysis. It's simply meant to be accepted. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that I think should be a libertarian issue that we agree with the left on are things like free speech and tolerance. And yet the left, so many people over there uh, paint themselves as being very tolerant, say tolerance is very important, but they don't have a lot of tolerance for dissenting views. And I think that's something the conservative movement does relatively well, uh, despite probably public perceptions to the contrary. Yeah, it's funny, I was, Jeffrey Simpson was writing just today that the old red Tories were much more ideologically flexible, and yet they seem to me to be very monotonous in their approach. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. I think that, uh, well, pr frankly, I think that libertarianism is the uh, the future of conservatism. I think that more and more conservatives are realizing that they don't need to uh, enforce their personal values. Uh, you know, you may be in favor of a traditional family, traditional lifestyle, and that's great. And in a libertarian society, you're completely free to pursue that. It just means you can't pass laws to tell your neighbor that he must also live in the way that you think he should. Yeah, so I have some sympathy with you that libertarianism is the future of conservatism and always will be, and just <laughs> that you can never get conservatives to notice it. So Matt Bluffton is not only attending, but participating in the Manning Center Conference. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.